thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you all for uh, hosting me. It's an honor uh, for me to uh, be here with you and address uh, this uh, distinguished audience uh, about uh, about my book, um, the uh, the Star and the Scepter: A Diplomatic History of uh, of Israel. Uh, as uh, Professor Kumar Swami uh, mentioned, uh, I admit that it is a very ambitious uh, project. And uh, I decided to undertake it after many years of uh, teaching a class on uh, Israel's foreign policy, uh, both at Tel Aviv University and at the IDC. And by the way, I'd like to salute uh, Nina Slama, who's here, who's been helping me teaching this class at IDC for many years. And so she also has a part in that, uh, in that book, because in fact, the, uh, you know, as you teach a topic and you, you get the feedback from students, it also helps you uh, improving your teaching and improving your writing. So uh, in the acknowledgments in the book, I do thank my, uh, my students who've helped me improve my teaching and, and, my, uh, and therefore the quality uh, of this book. Uh, so as uh, Professor Kumar Swami said, it's true that uh, since the, uh, uh, the two books by Michael Breacher in the early 70s, which by the way, are very theoretical, especially the foreign policy system of Israel, uh, deals more with theory than actually with Israeli foreign policy. But uh, since then, you've had all kinds of books dealing with certain aspects of Israel's foreign policy, uh, most typically the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict or the bilateral relation between Israel and the United States. But what was missing until now, uh, my, that was my impression from uh, all these years of teaching, was really a comprehensive book uh, on Israel's foreign policy covering all aspects of that policy. Now, when I started uh, undertaking such a project, I said to myself, yeah, but the problem with that is that, you know, the, uh, obviously Israel became independent in 1948, uh, but the history of the Jewish people does not start in 1948. Uh, if you were to write a historic or diplomatic history of uh, India or uh, of China or of Russia, uh, obviously you wouldn't start in, in the case of India in 1947. Uh, you know, the history starts right, right, way before uh, now, in the case of the Jewish people, obviously, uh, the, uh, the case of the Jewish people is unique in the sense that um, it has a long history, but most of that history, I would say two thirds of that history, uh, was devoid of uh, political sovereignty. And yet, uh, I claim in my book uh, that there was, a, uh, uh, there was what I call a Jewish diplomacy uh, during the many years of exile uh, after the Jews lost their sovereignty uh, in the early first uh, century under the, uh, under the uh, Roman Empire. And of course, there was a long history of Jewish kingdoms, uh, Hebrew kingdoms in ancient times. And there's a lot to learn from that in terms of diplomatic history. And that, that is why I, I undertook the very ambitious project of writing a 3000 year diplomatic history, which I admit is very ambitious, even though the bulk of the book indeed is about uh, Israel's uh, foreign policy. Uh, today, but uh, I do um, relate to uh, the foreign policy of the ancient kingdoms of Israel and also of the uh, foreign policy, what I call the diplomacy of uh, the Jewish diasporas uh, from antiquity uh, to uh, modernity. Uh, the, the title of the book uh, is inspired from a, uh, from a verse uh, from uh, the Hebrew Bible, because I do have also three chapters uh, in the book that deal with the, uh, the question of Israel and the nations in the Hebrew Bible. Because uh, obviously the Bible is not a, a history book, even though some of the books of the Bible have some historical value, uh, such as the books of Judges and, and Kings. Uh, but I think that it is impossible to understand the way the Jewish people relates to the world and to other nations without understanding how the founding document of, um, of the Jewish people has shaped and continues to influence the way the Jews perceive themselves and perceive their relation uh, to the world, which is also why I wrote three uh, chapters in the book on the topic of Israel and the nations in the Hebrew Bible. And as I, uh, for the purpose of this book, uh, reread the whole Bible in order to uh, figure out this uh, topic, uh, I came across a, um, 
a verse that inspired the title of the book uh, from the book of Numbers, chapter 24, uh, verse 17, in, in which it says, a star rises from Jacob and a scepter comes forth uh, from Israel, uh, which uh, seems confusing because uh, what is the meaning of the star? What is the meaning of the scepter? Uh, why is the star related to Jacob? Why is the scepter related to uh, Israel? And of course, uh, in my opinion, at least, uh, the way I understand it is that the star symbolizes uh, spirituality uh, and faith. It's the uh, symbol of Judaism. And the scepter symbolizes uh, political power, political might. Now, in the, uh, in the text of the Hebrew Bible, the name Israel, uh, or Israel in Hebrew, is given to Jacob at a very specific moment, uh, only after Jacob faces this mysterious angel in the middle of the night and overcomes him, only after Jacob, who was described until then as a frail intellectual uh, who was disconnected from the real world, and like his twin brother, Esau, who was the very opposite, who was a man of physical power, but devoid of any spirituality, and therefore neither of them uh, was um, capable uh, of inheriting and carrying on the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, heritage, the spiritual heritage of their father and grandfather. And it's only when Jacob proves his ability and willingness to fight in the real world for that, uh, for that spiritual heritage that he receives the name Israel. And yet, uh, the uh, text of the Hebrew Bible, even after that name is changed, keeps going back and forth uh, using both names, which doesn't happen in, any, in other cases in the Bible. Uh, the name, when, when Abraham used to be called Avram in Hebrew, and his name is changed, same thing for, with Sarah, who used to be called Sarai. And after the names are changed, that's it. You never go back to the older name. In the case of Jacob and Israel, it keeps going back and forth. My understanding of that is that Jacob never fully internalized uh, the need to become Israel, Israel, uh, to combine between the two, to combine between the star and the scepter. And I claim my central thesis in this book, as I said, after reviewing uh, about 3,000 years of diplomatic history, is that the Jewish people has always oscillated between a tendency to go for spirituality, abandoning political power or being attracted by political power, but disconnecting itself from a sense of historical purpose and, uh, and a historical heritage. And I think that whenever the Jewish people has been successful in its history and its relation with the nation, it is when it was able to combine the two, to combine on the one hand, uh, a strong sense of um, historical purpose, and on the other hand, uh, an ability and willingness to adapt that sense of historical purpose to the real world. Uh, what we traditionally call in international relations, a balance between idealism and realism. Uh, and I think that we, we see that uh, throughout history. If you look at ancient history, um, in, in ancient times, uh, this tension uh, very clearly appears uh, in, um, uh, for example, uh, the different texts of the Hebrew Bible. I have a, uh, in my chapter on Israel and nation in the Hebrew Bible, uh, I have a section that I called Jeremiah, prophet of historic, of political realism, question mark. Because I claim that one of the reasons why the Jews uh, survived since antiquity and like other uh, people from the uh, Middle East, is because not only did they have always a, a strong sense of historical mission and purpose, but also the narrative of the Bible is unique in the sense that other uh, ancient peoples, when they lost a war or were conquered by a foreign empire, considered, considered this to be the defeat of their own gods and the end of their history. But in the Hebrew Bible, on the other hand, the defeat of the Jewish people are described as a well-deserved punishment for not keeping the alliance. And therefore, uh, the defeat by the Jews, the, uh, the Jews being defeated and being conquered by empires was never 
understood by the Jews as the end of the history of the defeat of their God, but as a well-deserved punishment, which would be followed by eventual redemption and return. And this is very clearly something that you read in the book of Jeremiah. When Jeremiah says, don't rebel, you deserve it. And uh, if you want to come back, you need to go back to the alliance of the that was sealed at Sinai. You have to come back to your historical purpose as a people. But what's interesting in Jeremiah is that he kind of solves this uh, traditional tension between idealism and realism, between the star and the scepter, by saying, both, uh, by, by saying that going to reality, accepting reality, is in fact an act of faith. And so uh, that's an interesting point, I think, in Jeremiah. But, but you see this tension uh, in the history uh, of the Jews, in the diplomatic history of the Jews, also in antiquity. And just to give you two examples, if you, if you take the rebellion uh, against, the, um, against the Greeks uh, by the Hasmonean dynasty, so this rebellion was very clearly based on a sense of faithfulness to, um, uh, to Jewish culture and to the Jewish religion against the cultural imperialism uh, of the Greeks. And, and that rebellion was actually successful because it reestablished a Jewish kingdom uh, for a few hundred years uh, and that had to be recognized uh, by Greece as an independent uh, state. On the other hand, the rebellion against Rome by the Bar Kokhba group was completely disastrous uh, because it completely ignored the actual balance of powers between the Judean province, province and, um, and the Roman Empire. Uh, and so here we have two examples of, uh, you know, realism uh, versus idealism uh, in the case of the, re the rebellion against uh, uh, the, uh, the Greeks, it was successful. The rebellion against the Romans was uh, disastrous. And of course, the uh, million dollar question is, when do you know as a leader where to draw the line between political realism and idealism? Uh, and I think that here, uh, what you see through that history is that there were leaders, there were statesmen uh, that maybe it's in, intuition, you know, that had this, on the one hand, this strong sense of, um, of, of historical perspective on the one hand, and a strong sense of political realism on the other. But what you see also is that what I show in the history uh, of the Jews during the diaspora is that even though the Jews no, no longer had a sovereign state and a kingdom after the destruction of their province by the Roman Empire in the year 70, uh, of the common era, there still was, of course, uh, what I call the Jewish diplomacy with major Jewish uh, uh, statesmen and diplomat, whether it was Abar Vanel uh, with the uh, Kingdom of Spain, uh, whether it was Menashe ben uh, Israel, uh, who basically negotiated with Oliver Cromwell to reopen the gates of the British Isles to uh, enable the Jews from Europe to immigrate again uh, to the British Isles whether it was also the Damascus affair in 1840, where the Jews did not act as supplicants, but really as powerful actors, uh, whether it was the Rothschilds in uh, Europe, uh, whether it was politicians such as Adolphe Cremieux in France uh, or Montefiore in England, these people really had political and economic power that enabled them to negotiate directly, e almost as the equal with the Sultan, uh, with the uh, Ottoman Sultan to end this blood libel against the um, against the Jews of uh, Damascus, and with time the Jews were able to rebuild some kind of political power uh, in the uh, 19th century, especially uh, in Europe. But um, I think with the um, uh, the the turning point, of course, in terms of political power, was the decision of Theodor Herzl uh, to turn the old age vision of a return. Uh, to Zion into a political movement. And that decision was the outcome of a uh, historical disappointment uh, with European enlightenment and with the emancipation. Because basically the deal between the Jews of Europe and uh, the European countries, especially in France after the revolution, uh, had been summarized by a famous statement uh, by a French member of parliament during the debate of the French National Assembly on the question of whether or not the, uh, the French 
the uh, the uh, the regime of the French Revolution should grant equal rights to the Jews uh, uh, in accordance uh, with the Declaration of Human Rights proclaimed by the French Revolution. And one of, of the representatives of the French National Assembly, uh, his name was Stanislas de Clermont-Tonnerre, said, I'm willing to give everything to the Jews as individuals, but nothing as a nation. And the point was, if you guys want to be part of modern European society, you have to give up on, your, uh, on the national aspect of your identity. Now, of course, the, the Jews are a, a peculiar case of being altogether a, a nation and a religion. The deal with the French Revolution was you give up the national side of your identity, only keep the religious one, and then you become Frenchmen, Germans, or Britons uh, of the Jewish religion. That was the deal, and that deal basically was broken. Uh, so uh, that was that that was uh, uh, Tilda Herzog's conclusion after the Dreyfus affair, because Dreyfus had played the game to the end. He uh, really had completely abandoned the national side of his identity. He had become a Frenchman of uh, mosaic religion. He even had become uh, an officer in the French army, and then, and and yet he was still accused wrongly of uh, spying for Germany. And when Herzl heard the uh, the cries, death to the Jews, moral juif in Paris, he basically came to the conclusion that the whole thing had been a sham and the Jews were still considered a nation, uh, even by the, by the most enlightened and liberal regime of Europe, uh, the, the, the French Third Republic. And therefore he said, uh, we have to rebuild our national, uh, the national side of our identity and rebuild political power. And the moment he established the uh, the Jewish, the Zionist, uh, the Zionist Congress in ba in Basel in uh, 1870 in uh, in 1897. Immediately, the uh, the members of the uh, uh, Zionist Congress became Jewish statesmen and diplomats, and very soon they had to face the classical dilemmas of diplomacy. Uh, you know, once you become a political movement, once you have political ambitions in the real world you face dilemmas. And very clearly, those dilemmas uh, appeared. Probably the first dilemma faced by what I call Zionist diplomacy, by the Z diplomacy of the Zionist uh, movement, uh, was with the uh, case, the, the proposal of Uganda in 1903, because Herzl was looking for international support to establish, to reestablish a, a Jewish state uh, in uh, in the ancient land of Israel, now ruled by the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was not interested in such a project. Uh, the British Empire was, in a way, you had many philo-Semites in, um, in England uh, who were Zionists uh, and Christian Zionists in England, but, uh, uh, but England did not control the Middle East. And so in 1903, uh, the, uh, the Secretary of the Colonies of, uh, of England proposed to Herzl a, a land in Africa in Uganda. And that proposal was actually submitted by Herzl to the Zionist Congress in 1903. And it created a, a huge controversy, very heated debates. Typically, it was a debate between political realism and idealism. Why? Because there was a, an emergency. Uh, it was at the pike of uh, anti-Jewish pogroms in uh, Russia, and therefore there was a need uh, for some kind of Jewish sovereignty here and now in order to provide a safe haven to the Jews of Russia. On the other hand, it was abandoning uh, the land of Israel and Zion, uh, Jerusalem. And that's what the debate was about. It was typically a debate uh, between the star and the scepter, uh, between political power here and now and faithfulness to your history and your roots. At the end, uh, the Uganda proposal was uh, rejected, as we know, but it was probably the first test uh, of, um, of the Zionist uh, leadership. I think that the second test came many years later under the British Empire, when on the one hand, you had this charter for uh, recognizing the national rights of the Jewish people, uh, the Balfour Declaration, which uh, was eventually endorsed by the League of Nations. Uh, and yet during the second de decade of the British mandate, uh, because of politics and geopolitics, uh, the British Empire, empire basically uh, basically uh, walked away from its commitment to, uh, the, to the Zionist movement and to the Balfour Declaration. Uh, 
uh, and it became very clear that uh, uh, the the mandate would not turn into a, a, a unitary country uh, because of the conflict between the Arabs uh, and the Jews that culminated in the uh, basically the civil war that erupted between the two communities in 1936. By the way, the very same year that the civil war erupted in Spain uh, at the same time, even though for completely different reasons, obviously. But eventually the British uh, government decided uh, to come up with a solution, uh, and that's how it established the Peel Commission in uh, 1937, which for the first time suggested partition, partitioning the mandate between two states, an Arab state uh, and a Jewish state. Again, uh, this was a test of realism versus idealism, because when you look at the map of the Peel Commission, uh, what it granted to a Jewish state was a teeny, teeny territory in the northern part of what is today Israel without Jerusalem. Jerusalem was supposed to remain under, under British sovereignty. Uh, it was completely uh, unacceptable to most uh, Zionist leaders uh, at the time. And yet Ben-Gurion, who already had a prominent role in the political leadership of the Jewish community of British Palestine, was willing to consider it uh, precisely because uh, again, in terms of uh, emergency, the Nazis already had been in power in Germany for four years, and there was a need for uh, a, a national, a sovereign Jewish state in order to accept immigration without the restriction imposed by the uh, British authorities. On the other hand, uh, as I said, the, the territory was so small that it was unacceptable. And, and this debate around partition, around the Pill Commission, very much crystallized the political map of the Jewish community of British Palestine, what we call in Hebrew uh, the Yeshuv. When you look at the dividing lines of Israel's political spectrum today, they were very much influenced and shaped already back then uh, around the debate con uh, on the, um, on the uh, partition plan proposed by the, by the Pill Commission, which, by the way, was uh, very quickly shelved by the British government and became moot anyways. But there was a very first debate uh, within the issue. Eventually, Ben-Gurion accepted the principle uh, of partition. And again, uh, 10 years later, uh, when a similar idea was uh, proposed by the UN General Assembly uh, in 1947, uh, again, Ben-Gurion accepted it, even though the, uh, the borders were extremely problematic, even though the UN partition plan did not include uh, Jerusalem. Uh, but... Uh, when uh, Ben-Gurion was reminded about uh, the, 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 the fact that uh, six years later, the Zionist Congress had adopted a resolution in New York, uh, it was actually uh, five years earlier, 1942, uh, at the Biltmore Hotel. And the resolution was called the Biltmore Resolution because... Uh, Obviously, the Zionist Congress couldn't meet in Europe because of the war and the occupation of Europe by the Nazis, so it now it met in New York. And the Biltmore uh, Conference adopted a resolution that called upon the establishment of, quote, a Jewish commonwealth uh, in all of British Palestine, uh, all, all, all of the mandate, uh, basically rejecting the idea of partition. Now, five years later, uh, Ben-Gurion accepted the principle of partition because in the meantime, of course, uh, six million Jews had been killed in Europe, and there was again a sense of emergency. And so when Ben-Gurion was reminded by his critics of the fact that the Biltmore uh, proposal uh, or resolution had called for a Jewish state or Jewish commonwealth on all of the mandate, his answer was, his reply was, quote unquote, Biltmore, Schmiltmore, we need a state. So that was the political realism of Ben-Gurion. He also knew, by the way, that the borders of Israel would not be determined uh, by the UN resolution, but by war. And by the way, this is also something that I explain in my book, uh, that uh, the idea that the UN established Israel in 1947 is a myth, because the, general, the votes of the General Assembly are not binding in international law. This was only, uh, the, the General Assembly resolutions are only recommendations. So, the UN only recommended the partition uh, of the British mandate, but since that, uh, it was never adopted as a binding security resolution, for example. It was only a UN resolution, 
And since it was rejected by the Arab League, it became moot anyways. I mean, in the case of India and Pakistan, it was agreed by both sides, the partition. But in the case of the Jews and the Arabs, it was rejected by the Arab League. It was not a binding resolution of the UN. And so again, the idea that the UN created Israel is, is a myth. It's simply not true. And Ben-Gurion knew it. And that's why Ben-Gurion, in the, Israel's declaration of independence, and that's what I claim that Ben-Gurion uh, was probably the ultimate uh, uh, leader uh, of the Jewish people in modern times, who knew how to find this delicate balance between the star and the scepter, uh, political realism on the one hand, and very strong connection to the Jewish past and to Jewish history on the other, because when you read the Declaration of Independence, it, it talks about ancient Jewish history, it talks about the continuity of Jewish history, about the connection between the people and the land. It declares, quote unquote, the establishment of a Jewish state in the land of Israel. This is very clearly, uh, very clearly a leader who's very connected to Jewish history and to the Jewish past. But on the other hand, he also realizes that in the reality right now, uh, uh, partition is the best Israel can or the Jewish people can expect. And that's why, by the way, if you look at Israel's declaration of independence, uh, he excluded from the text the issue of borders. Uh, Israel declared its independence without specifying in which borders. Why? Well, because the borders that had been recommended by the uh, United Nations were only a recommendation. They were not binding. And Ben-Gurion knew that the Arab League had rejected that plan and had already declared that they would attack Israel if it was to declare its independence. And therefore, what would eventually determine the borders of Israel wouldn't be the UN plan, but war, which is, is exactly what happened eventually. And therefore, Israel had two options when it declared its independence. According to the principle uh, in international law of, uh, uh, of uti possidetis, Israel could have declared its independence in all of the British mandate, because you can't inherit a former sovereign. The moment the British Empire announced that it was ending its uh, mandate, it unilaterally abandoned its sovereignty. So there was a legal void created on the 15th of May 1948 because there no longer was a sovereign and there no longer was a flag. So by international law, if you meet the criteria of the Montevideo uh, Convention of 1933, if you have a territory, a people, a population, and a government, you can declare your independence. Uh, Israel, I mean, uh, the newly established state of Israel could have theoretically declared its independence on all the territory. Uh, but that, obviously, if it, if it had done that, it would have lost its Jewish majority, and it would also have completely uh, ignored the UN resolution that, even though it was not binding, it still bore a significance because it expressed the willingness of the majority of the uh, UN members. On the other hand, if Ben-Gurion had declared independence only within the borders recommended by the partition plan, then any Israeli sovereignty beyond those lines would have been considered illegitimate, if not illegal. Uh, therefore, all the territories that Israel actually conquered in 1948 would have been considered occupied by Israel itself if Israel had limited its sovereignty legally only within the non-binding borders of the partition plan. So I think here we have a very clear case of a, uh, in the case of Ben-Gurion and declaration of dependence of a, um, a successful combining of uh, uh, political realism and, uh, and uh, faithfulness to the, uh, to the past. And so I don't know how long, uh, uh, I mean, I want to leave enough time also to questions. So I don't know, Professor Kumar Swami, how long I should be talking. Uh, uh, you know, we're academics, we can talk forever. You know, we, we, we paid for that. So, uh, but I would like to leave enough time uh, for, uh, uh, for questions from the uh, audience. So just let me know how, how much more time I, I have and then uh, and how much time we should leave to questions. Uh, I'll wait. Yes, sir. Uh, professor, you can take another five minutes then we can have a discussion, okay. sir. Okay. Right. So, so um, obviously, the uh, you know the book uh, also deals with uh, not only, of course, with the uh, Israel and and the Arab world and the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, but also uh, the uh, you know the explaining the normalization that we have uh, in recent years uh, with the uh, with the Arab world 
Uh, I have chapters, also a chapter on Israel and Asia, which includes, by the way, of course, the, our relation with uh, with India. But I just want to one last word on uh, on the normalization that we're witnessing uh, today with the uh, Sunni states of uh, of the Gulf, uh, and maybe also with uh, in the future with Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think that what's interesting here is that, in a way, it is a kind of reincarnation, uh, kind of upside down, of the strategy of Israel's foreign policy strategy and in the late 1950s and early 60s. What Ben-Gurion initiated at the time as what he called the strategy of the periphery, which consisted of building alliances uh, around the Middle East with non-Arab countries that uh, had a common enmity vis-a-vis vis-a-vis uh, vis the Soviet Union uh, and uh, um, and Arab nationalism led by uh, the Egyptian president. So Israel in the 60s built an alliance of the periphery with Iran, uh, with uh, Turkey, uh, but also with Ethiopia and other minorities in the Middle East against the Arab world. Fast forward in 2020, what you have today, you still have a periphery, but it's upside down. Today, Iran is an enemy state. Turkey has become a serious challenge. Uh, let's call it this way. And, and today, basically, what you have is a periphery on an alliance between Israel, the Sunni states, but also a country like Greece, also a country like Azerbaijan in the Caucasus, against Iran and against Turkey, the former allies of the 1960s. So, I think the, the, the alliance of the periphery is still relevant in Israel's foreign policy. It's just that it's been turned upside down from, um, from what it was uh, in, the, uh, in, the 19, uh, in the 1960s. So uh, I'll leave it here. Uh, as I said, you know, uh, I, uh, for about a little bit more than half an hour, I, uh, I spoke about 3,000 years of uh, diplomatic history. Uh, you know, I hope that nobody fell asleep because whoever whoever fell asleep for five minutes missed uh, 300 years of history. So I, I hope you were all awake. And uh, and I'll leave it here for uh, for questions and, and comments and debates. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you.